fuel scarcity and NPLC not supplying us, oil marketers. I am Bola Oba and this is Plus Politics. Marketers have blamed the fresh scarcity of premium motor spirit, PMS, popularly known as Petro, on a supply challenge from the major oil supplier in the country, the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPCL. The national president of the Petroleum Products Retail Outlets Owners Association of Nigeria, Petron, Billy Gilizari made this known on Monday. The fresh fuel scarcity has grounded many economic activities in states across the Federation as Nigerians queue up at filling stations nationwide. While some motorists were lucky to get fuel at some retail outlets for between 700 naira and 1,200 naira per litre, after hours of sweat and contest, authors weren't so lucky as many retail outlets were shot. With their SQs being supply challenge, the shortage of the premium product saw the black marketers selling the product for as high as 2,000 naira per litre in states. Joining us is a public affairs analyst, Mohamed Abdullahi, the Independent Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria, Ipman's Public Relations Officer, Uche Chuku Ukadike, has also joined us, and Nick Agule, who is an oil and gas expert based in the United Kingdom, joins us as well. Gentlemen, welcome to Plus Politics this evening. Uh, good evening, Nigerians. It was my pleasure. Uh, Unfortunately, Nepal just... <laughs> <laughs> it's getting it's more interesting. Uh, the dysfunctionality the dif dysfunctionality of the state is getting quite... Uh, okay, let's start with Tukadike. Uh, how would you want to start? You being the spokesperson of one of the major uh, associations. Okay. Uh, okay, Mohammed, what is your experience where you are located in Nigeria and where exactly are you located in Nigeria, Mohammed? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, from Kaduna this evening, uh, it's, it's quite challenging to find uh, uh, patrol almost everywhere within the metropolis. Uh, I think one uh, uh, fuel station that we're able to find petrol is selling for more than 1,000 there. And even at this price, it's quite difficult for you to, uh, perhaps in more than four or five hours, there is no assurance that you can get uh, uh, even 10 liters. So it's been, it's been quite uh, difficult, it's been quite challenging. Businesses are, are grounded, like I just told you now. Uh, when we uh, hook onto this uh, program, uh, there was power supply, but now immediately we're about starting. Nepal just struck, and you can see that uh, my background is quite dark. Uh, so these are some of the challenges we are facing. You know, uh, you understand that petroleum is not just for uh, transportation. We also equally use that for our generators to power our businesses and even our homes. So this is a difficult situation that uh, perhaps the government and those stakeholders in charge should look forward in resolving immediately. The two weeks that we have been told, I think, is a very long time. <laughs> With all the difficulties and challenges Nigerians are facing at the moment, I think telling Nigerians that this will persist for another two weeks is like, uh, I don't want to imagine what uh, this will be. Uh, so this is the situation from Kaduna at the moment. Yeah. Nick, you may be based in the UK as we speak, but you, uh, experientially, you are an oil man a veteran oil man in that what would be uh, your take of why this Malay is still persisting in Nigeria? Why are we still 
where we are relative to a consistent supply of products to for uh, you know, to outlets uh, thank you thank you very much it may interest you to actually know that i am in abuja the federal capital i was actually Nigeria. looking at the background you know uh, i don't i didn't want to my producers told me you know, and the last time we spoke you were literally uh in the uk but it's looking more yes. homely this time around i i hope they won't take your they won't take your light too. well i i have a, a solar panels and then a inverter and then batteries fantastic uh, in the house here yeah? it cost me a lot of money to install and that assures me continuity of power when the public power goes uh, in the estate where I live here, uh, we just paid in the last uh, seven, ten days. In fact, we are still paying. Some residents are still contributing. We both contributed over a million naira each to upgrade our transformer from um, 500 uh, kVA to 1,000 kVA because the 500 was no longer coping with our demand. And this is money that we paid from our pockets only for AEDC to now pass power through that transformer and bill us, you know, and, and then the minister talks about uh, cost-reflective tariffs. I don't know, we are already picking up the cost uh, through uh, investment uh, uh, Nick, in infrastructure. Nick, yeah. I think there is a fact you may be missing in that portraiture of perfidy. The irony is that you people contributed the money but automatically, the electricity distribution company in that locale will be claiming that asset as its own in its books. Uh, did you get me? Very true. Uh, uh, that Very is the true. most Not perfidious. Only claim it in his books. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, not only with the electricity company will not classify the monies that we paid for this transformer, which is big money. I mean, every resident contributed over a million, I can only imagine how much that is. Not only will they take that in their books, their own staff can come and vandalize that, that transformer. You know, we even saw pictures the other day where their staff came and took a whole transformer. Pretending I wanted it on, uh, on the truck. Oh, yeah, you're you right. Know, so, like in our okay, case, uh, our security are permanently stationed to keep an eye on our transformer. Uh, Nick, there are anybody, so uh, as much as, Nick, as much as that is a yes. very interesting topic to go into, uh, we, we really have to stay on the ball. Uh, uh, what would be your take of why we are suffering this shortage of product? especially PMS, at uh, four courts. There's only one reason. Only one reason. And that reason is because we are not refining enough petroleum products in Nigeria so that we can have product sufficiency. Nigeria has got four refineries owned by Nigerians, but managed by the NMPC on our behalf. And the capacity of these four refineries is 445,000 barrels of crude oil per day. If these four refineries were refining at their capacity, we will have more than enough product in Nigeria and we will be exporting the balance. So the simple answer to your question is that we are not refining what we are consuming we are depending on other nations and anytime there is any supply chain issue from where we are going to bring these products we suffer it you know i i i tell people that we never ever believed that it was possible that a day we arise in this world where no flight as in like no single flight will be in the air globally during but COVID? that day came with COVID, and no flight was in the air. 
Now, can we imagine that day that an event will happen that there will be no shipping globally? Once there is no shipping globally, Nigeria, a major oil and gas producer, is not going to have petroleum products. Nigeria will be grounded. Nigeria will be on zero. I mean, thankfully, Dan Kote has come to, to clear away our shame. If you go to other nations, they have what you call strategic reserves. Strategic reserves are stock of crude oil and refined products that have been kept as a safety net for the nations, such that if there is a catastrophic event that shuts down refinery, shuts down crude oil production and all of that, the nation will still survive for several weeks or months on their reserve. Nigeria does not even have a single strategic reserve. So if there is any problem at a papa port, when the ships are coming in, already Nigeria is having few crises. We don't even have that safety net. And we're an oil and gas producing nation. And the, 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 finally, the, the question is that, why are we having four refineries and we're not refining anything? The refineries, as I speak I, today, I'll come to you. I'll are come back to you. zero barrels of crude oil. I, I, Nick, why is that so? Nick Agule, yeah. I'll come back to you on that, more so because of your rich experience in the industry as somebody who uh, once served in, in that industry. I'll come back to you on that. Let me go back to Kaduna and engage Mohammed the B. Mohammed, uh, I, yeah. I almost wanted to cancel this show today because I, I, I literally have to drive from the mainland to the island and I was looking at my, uh, to think that uh, I have staff, you know, members of staff of, of one of the companies where I'm a director where they go out to go and get the product. Uh, last uh, yesterday, uh, one of my dispatch riders was literally at the forecourt to get product. It took him about six, seven hours, and he had to pay a thousand naira on every thirty liter uh, jerry can or whatever they call it that they bought with. I wonder what you people are experiencing in Kaduna. If Lagos is that, uh, if Lagos is that grounded, uh, you know, how are businesses taking it? How are you know ordinary Nigerians like you taking it? What's the ostensible? What's the designable effect on the socioeconomic it's, scenario uh, of Kaduna? It's it's quite unfortunate. Um, uh, like uh, the gentleman just mentioned, uh, we as a country do not have any safety net at all. A little challenge uh, on the supply chains or the value chains of everything in this country, then the country is almost grounded. Seriously, you need to see jerry cans, uh, people carrying generators here and there, and even the queues across uh, the metropolis and even the outskirts of Kaduna State. The queues are so long. There are some, there, there are some that are more than a kilometer to, or even more. And people are just queuing. There is no hope. There is no 10% iota of hope that they are even getting the petroleum product. I mean the petrol. They are just queuing with the hope that, let's just be here. Some have been queuing for the, for, since 4 a.m. So, some even since 3 a.m. since yesterday or two days ago. And still, there is no petroleum product. There is no fuel. So it's quite challenging. Uh, businesses, like I said earlier, have been grounded. You know, uh, transportation has skyrocketed. Uh, places where some of the very few commercial vehicles and uh, uh, commercial, uh, uh, what we call magua here, that have got uh, fuel, they charge almost three times of what uh, uh, the normal price is. And not even two times. Almost three times or even more. If you are lucky to find public uh, vehicles and public transportation that have got uh, petrol to move around. You know, so it's, it's quite challenging that at this time and age, uh, uh, for a country that has been uh, independent since 1960, and like the gentleman rightly mentioned, uh, you know, discovered oil since 1959, even before independence, we are still 
suffering this kind of challenge in this time and age is, is, is quite shocking and doesn't speak well of us as a nation. So you keep thinking, what does people who are charged, I mean, the stakeholders charged with formulating policies, uh, have been, what have they been doing all these years? That what every time you have little, what the NMPCL is telling Nigerians is the fact that there is distribution problem, there is logistics problem. So at this time of an age, if there is a logistic problem, we have to wait for more than two, three weeks before things should go back to normal. What is being put in place to make sure that the next time there is and you know, logistic and, problem... And you, know the irony, the, and you know the irony is that they're giving the excuse as though uh, their suppliers would not have intimated them with the fact that they wanted to do turnaround maintenance. Because if you have a contract with any responsible company or any responsible commercial entity, they would have known that they wanted to do their turnaround maintenance and they would have intimated their, 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 their customers. So I, I'm sitting there thinking sometimes the public communications experts who speak on behalf of uh, entities like NMPCL, do they even think that people don't think at all? Because they are speaking to the lacuna in the supply chain. But somebody somewhere ought to know that if you tell that story, people also would ordinarily know that your suppliers would have told you that they were going to be doing the, the maintenance. The, why didn't you then stock XX that will last the period of the maintenance? Yeah. Okay, well, it's quite unfortunate. People don't do their jobs. And because and there is no consequence. You know, in, in, in Senate climes, for instance, seriously, uh, people can even resign. People could resign for such things or get sacked. You understand? Because you look at what the economy is suffering. Nigerians are going through a lot at the moment. And with this, you know, issue of petroleum scarcity, it's like tripling the pain, not even doubling. It's like, like tripling the pain that we are going through before. Mohammed, so some people pay for that. Mohammed, yes. to, co yes. to corroborate your point, I think about a week ago, uh, you know, I was watching one of these international uh, news channels and the head of Israeli uh, armies, uh, intelligence unit was voluntarily he, he was voluntarily uh, resigning until a replacement could be found for him uh, to, to replace him he, he said because he dropped the ball that Hamas could at, you know could attack Israel that he felt that after they had persecuted the the counter attack to a point it was, in, it was incumbent on him to at least do the right thing to show contrition. And I, was, I, and I was looking at it and I was thinking, you know what? They will, they will come to a, a city, some, some ragtag army would attack a city like Kaduna and take scores of people away. And the best we see is that the minister of, the minister or minister of state or the IGP or the, or the chief of defense staff will just go and pay, we just go and pay a visit. Nothing happens. Nobody, nobody pays the price, like you really said. I, I'll come back to you, Mohammed. Uh, Nick. Nick, you're an oil man. Yes, oil man, true and true. And once you're an oil man, always an oil man. Uh, we have to speak to some specifics here. Like Mohammed said, they have told the public that there is a a kind of a gap in the supply supply chain. And one is wondering, like I wondered aloud earlier on, one is wondering, okay, would their suppliers not have told them that they were going to do the turnaround maintenance that they, the, the NMPCL spokespersons are now claiming is the cause of this fuel shortage? Nick? 
Well, incidentally, the NFPC itself has not even told us there's a supply problem. The NFPC has a template of a media release that they make anytime queues surface at petrol stations in Nigeria. And in that media release, they will tell you that they have uh, over 1.5 billion liters of fuel in storage that will last us for 30 days, that there is no cause for alarm. You know, that is what they've told us even this time around. But as we know, we already seen the petrol at the stations, and that is why the queues are there. The independent marketers are being even being a little bit more honest with us by telling us that from what they can see with the supply uh, chain issues, that this whole thing will clear in about two weeks. Now, uh, the government of President Tinubu has to take one thing at heart. You cannot keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. Nigeria owns four refineries. These refineries have not refined a single liter of petrol on and off for upward of 20 years now. In fact, the last liter of petrol that any refinery out of these four could have even churned out would have been four, five, eight years ago. So now that President Tinibu has taken power, he is also an oil man like me. He's an oil man. He's our person. He knows this thing. And he's fully aware that between upstream, where you actually look for oil, and then you drill for the oil, and then you produce the oil, and the downstream, where you just simply cook the oil and, then, uh, and produce products, it, it, it's like a difference between uh, uh, algebra and, uh, and, and, and one plus one. The difference is so clear. You know, the, the, the whole refining process is so simple that it, it only involves you boiling crude oil. You put crude oil in a furnace, in a fiery furnace, and boil it. And once you boil it at different levels of temperature, the different petroleum products begin to come off from that uh, crude oil. So if this NMPC has been unable to do this kind of simple process, for 20 years running, and we have not even produced anything for like five, eight years, immediately he came to power. He should have just changed the game by saying, sorry, NMPC, I'm a lawyer man. We gave you these refineries. Nothing is coming out of them. I'm taking them away from you. But and ironically, ironically, he just, he just re-engaged the man. He's just a new reason. Ironically, and against the position that you just you just uh, given, the president just re-engaged or reappointed the group chief executive officer of NMPCL. Exactly. So, unlike other agencies of government, like the central bank, you know, the FIRS, you know, all of those places where he went and overhauled the entire management team for inexplicable reasons, President Tinubu has kept the management of the NMPC intact. And this management of the NMPC has continued to mismanage the downstream petroleum sector in Nigeria, such that as we speak today, and like my colleague Mohammed said, there are Nigerians who slept at the petrol station last night. There are some who are on the queue to sleep tonight. Why the NMPC group managing director and his team of executives will sleep in their beds because they don't go out to look for petrol. They have reserve that is serving them. If they had any modicum of conscience, is to take that their resignation letters and, and move because you cannot bring a whole nation to its knees and there are no consequences. So for me, I'm putting this thing squarely on the table of President Tinubu. I don't know why he believes that the NPC can do it when this same NPC has not done it for the past 20 years plus. And President Tinubu should know 
Hello, Nick. Okay, uh, uh, Mohammed. From the yes, that Nigeria refinery. Because when the president of Sanjor was about to leave office in 2007, he sold the refineries. The refineries they got a market. They got buyers. It means the buyers must have done their due diligence and they saw value in the refineries before they paid for them. So if, if you, you know, uh, came, Nick. You know the paradox. The paradox inherent in this factual. A point you're making is that Dangote and Otedola formed a consortium and they, they practically and literally bought Portacot Reformery. It was when President Umar Yadua came into power, a gentleman that he was, and the labor movement went gaga on him that those, item, that those assets were sold on the cheap to those who bought it, that they relinquished it. it, it, it practically like the, the, the country got it back from them. The irony is that Dan Gote, an individual, an individual has now put up a refinery that is more than twice the size and the capacity of the one he could have managed better and probably expand for Nigeria. Look at how we function across the value chain of society. Labor acts without common sense. Sometimes they just go, they want to, they just want to be seen to be doing a luta. People in leadership will gladly breach the, 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 the sanctity of contract because they want to, they want to be patronizing to people that they need sometimes to be firm with, with a view to making sure that correct processes are put in place. I, I don't know how you want to respond to some of the points I've made. No, you are, you are very correct. You know, uh, for me, I thought that, uh, I don't have evidence, but in my mind, I thought that those who were cashing in on the fuel subsidy scam, they were a powerful lobby group with trillions of naira backing their monies they took off from from fuel subsidy and they were using that to sponsor all sorts of agitations against the sale of the refineries because they knew that immediately the refineries are back into production that will be the end of fuel importation and that will be the end of subsidy so uh, but that is water under the bridge that has happened how do we go forward to go forward I, and I believe, I have the, the backing of Mohammed, my, my co-panelist, and yourself, our host, that we are asking President Tinubu to go back to that template. Let him ask for the template for the sale of those refineries to be resurrected, uh, uh, and then brushed up me. and updated to me. current realities, and put up these refineries again for sale, and I'm sure there will be a market for that. Uh, if he had done that in his first day in office, some of the refineries will be back into production today, as we speak already. Uh, but but I, I'll come back to you on that, Nick. Uh, the, the, disturbing, the disturbing fact about that is that in the backdrop of the malady that, uh, that eventually happened in the very dystopic way that the uh, power power sector was privatized. Unlike the gains and traction that the telecoms industry gave us, many Nigerians are not only disillusioned about privatization now, but you see some of these some of these um, I, I, I don't want to use the common words, but some of those people who profit from the dysfunctionalism will now have ample enough uh, reason to, like you said earlier, on, put some people out to go and protest. I'll come back to you on that, but let me let me go to Mohammed in Kaduna. Mohammed, the disjointed facts yes. that we are seeing crystallizing now, it, 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 the disjointed facts are speaking to the fact that even that two weeks may not may not be because uh, NMPC is not the only owning up the independent. Uh, marketers who are just who are just conduits 
to channeling the products to the general public at the one speaking, and they may not be at full grasp. The NMPC is practically, from my viewpoint, is even practically deceiving Nigerians. Because NMPC is claiming that they've got products to sell and that there shouldn't be that shortage. But those who daily get the products from them are telling us that it may be up to two weeks. And somebody like you is saying life is miserable enough for an average Nigerian. How would you want to re respond to that? Yes, I think it, it's simple. Is that uh, people should own up to their responsibilities. Um, I quite agree with the point made uh, by uh, my co-panelists. Seriously, uh, that you know, the, the the crux of this matter is the fact that we are not refining a lot uh, enough, uh, it's, and it's quite shocking even to the world that it's almost a year. Now, I think in less than maybe 10 days or so, if I'm, if, if, I'm, if I'm correct, it will be almost a year since Nigeria commissioned, commissioned, just mark that word, commissioned the world largest refinery. It is almost a year. Yes, I remember it was about when the last, the previous president, Muhammad Bari, wanted to leave office, that we so commissioned the Dangote refinery, said to be the largest refinery in the world. And almost a year after, now we commissioned this so-called largest refinery in, Af in, in, the, in the world. Nigeria is plunged into uh, a forest scarcity crisis. I don't understand how you want to juxtapose uh, these two different opposites. Uh, Mohammed, Mohammed, Mohammed. Yes. yes. But, but you will realize that at some point, the NMPC uh, could not even supply Dangote the requisite volume of crude. It, it, that was needed that was needed to run the refinery normally. He had to import crude. So mm. look some <laughs> and challenges we talk about. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. So there are many challenges. There are many challenges in the value chain. So if you look at this point that I'm making that we have the largest refinery in the world, yet we are unable to refine our own petroleum products. You understand? We are unable to supply such refinery with even the crude oil, the basic, on its own. You see where there are so many problems. So it means even even if uh, the four government refineries are working, will they be able to also get crude <laughs> to to refine? So there are many problems, and the the the, the, the fault lies squarely with the government because a whole lot of uh, these challenges lies squarely uh, with the government, you know, is in their plate. To be honest with you, I think, uh, Mohammed, Mohammed, I think, uh, I think yeah. you are a, a bit too generous. In any liberal democracy, in any liberal democracy, especially a liberal democracy that practices presidential system of government, like President Truman had a plaque on his table, the book stops on the president's table. If Nigeria at this juncture is experiencing the the malady, the unfortunate scenario that is playing out now on the supply of a product that we are so fortunate. Continue, my brother. That was <laughs> that we're so fortunate to have been blessed with naturally. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's 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 really shocking. So I, I think the, the government needs to revisit the plan. You know, we need to be very categorical and intentional on what we want. And how many years will it take for us to, you know, practically refine what we require and even more? And like he made a very serious point earlier. Nobody saw COVID coming. COVID came and grounded a lot of things. Things that were thought are not possible became possible. Now, Google is making a plan also in the nearest future, like he rightly mentioned, is a very good point, that who says shipping can't stop? Like we are experiencing the, the war between Ukraine and Russia for the past two years, uh, that has grounded uh, a lot of shipping. Mohammed. You understand? Who says that can't stop? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the example, the most contemporary example, a group of ragtag, ragtag freedom fighters 
wanting to liberate their country from the stranglehold of some foreign powers, Saudi Arabia and some Western foreign powers, the Houthis, for weeks mm. on end now, have really subjected global shipping to a form of disruption, a major form of disruption yeah. that is not only affecting how goods move, the time it takes for goods to get to destinations, because some shipping companies have refused to go in the direction of, in the direction of the Middle East to go to go ferry cargo, like like mm. crude in that in that area, and is now taking America, United Kingdom, France, and some other NATO countries to go and be attacking. Hey, look, it could happen. Any so many factors could cause it. And if anybody who is in leadership in a country like Nigeria does not see that coming, maybe that's one of the reasons that why people who got supplies from NMPC are the ones now telling us that is a turnaround maintenance that is holding NMPC down. Well, let's go to the airman. Uh, Nick, sorry, you are the... You are the uh, Emotional punching bag, yeah, because you know the industry more than more than the two of us who are participating. From your own experience, from your experience, what are the specifics apart from some of the recommendations you made that look if we had sorted the problem of production, we will not be in this cold sack. What are the specifics that could be precipitating this madness? Well, for me. The specifics are simple. You look at a nation like uh, Singapore, Singapore does not produce a single barrel of crude oil. Because for people who know Singapore is a city state, so Singapore, you, you just look at Lagos. Lagos would have been a city, would have been a country. There's no land for even for agriculture. You know, so, but Singapore has one of the largest refining capacities in the world. And they take crude oil from the likes of Nigeria, they refine it, and sell it back to Nigeria. So as we queue up to the petrol stations in Nigeria to buy petrol, we are paying the salaries of the Singaporeans who are working in the, in the refineries over there. We're paying for the taxes that the refineries that are paying to the Singapore government. We're paying for the shipping cost of carrying the crew to Singapore and bringing the refined products back from Singapore, the insurance, the port handling, the demo rate, and all of that. And there is only one entity that is bringing all this to Nigerians, is the NMPC. The NMPC that government handed our four refineries and they are not doing it. If there's any reason why President Tinubu thinks that the NMPC can do it, these scarcities that we have been having since he took office should convince him that the NMPC is the same. That they change their name from corporation to company limited does not make any difference. You know, so if President Tinibu wants to solve this problem, he just needs to take these refineries and put them into private management. A lot of people think that, oh, if we carry our national assets and put it to private management, we are going to be, um, we, we will be robbed, you know, they will charge too many high prices. And uh, but like but you know, uh, but Nick, but like you know, uh, some, some of the primordial forces uh, that are practically holding this country aground are play because some people will think, okay, if they privatize NMPC now, all our children, all our tribesmen uh, may be flushed out. Uh, if they privatize NMPCL now, some of the some of the quote unquote my own coinage, some of the lootings that they get either directly or vicariously from the mismanagement from the culture of mismanagement. Yeah, you could. Uh, why, why am I even speaking like for for years, for years, refineries like Portacourt, Kaduna did not pro produce a drop of refined product. And people were paid billions of naira for for doing practically nothing than just going to the. I would even want to believe that many of them would not be going to that to those offices and we paid billions. 
So those forces may be so powerful that the, the president is beholden to them. But maybe when reasonable voices like yours keep preponderating, you may want to, 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 to do the right thing. I don't know. Your take. There's nothing like powerful... Uh, I'm sorry, please, uh, Mr. Nick. I'm just, I just have to cut in. There's nothing like powerful forces where there is a serious government that wants to, you know, carry out reforms. Seriously. For instance, let's, let's digress a bit. You see the allegations against the, uh, the immediate past uh, governor of uh, Gorgi State. He's a member of APC. In fact, a very important member. He just left office not more than two months ago or so and so on. But the AFCC is already on its trail. And that is what should be. It doesn't matter where you belong. What is, what, what is important is let the job be done. So it is. it behoves on President Tunubu that in his time, you understand, that Nigeria gets its right. And there are critical sectors. The energy sector is very, very critical. Since Nigeria is almost a monopoly uh, economy, uh, you understand? Mono economy, sorry. So monopoly it's very economy. important that it, it doesn't put anywhere. Look at what the CPN is doing. Sucking people that they feel, you know, are just there doing nothing causing government a whole lot of uh, money. Taking critical departments from Abuja to Lagos, where the work is, rather than leaving it in Abuja and, and, and sending staff pay, after paying their salary, uh, they are but, paying their you could uh, see, allowances and so on. But you could they see the Ferrari. You, no, you could see the Ferrari that generated too. <laughs> I, I said... But it happened. It, 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 it happened and it's happening. That's what I said. Yeah, if the, if the government is serious, particularly the president, I want to write his name in the sand of time. It is important that this sector is really cleansed. Because it's really shameful that after 64 years of independence, or 63 years going to 64, we are still importing petroleum product, PMS. Come on. It's, it's really shameful. And every now and then, we have this scarcity that will last for about one month, then it's cleared, everybody goes back to sleep. Then after in December time again, we, we experience that you know it's the cycle keeps continuing and moving. Uh, and, okay, you know, let, let me go. Short. Let me go to Nick now. Nick, I, I wouldn't know if you if you uh, saw that footage of a group of Nigerian tourists in South Korea and the tour guide in some of these uh, coaches. The tour guide was telling them what you know they were going to see and. At some point, said, "Okay, and we also see a refinery, uh, and that refinery, you people send crude, crude oil from Nigeria. We process it here, we refine, and we send back to you. And, and you know, uh, some people, some people uh, giggled, and uh, you know, uh, and it disturbed so many uh, sane human beings who got to watch it. I wouldn't know if you saw it." But that seems to be the story of Nigerian Hoy. Nick? Yes, I, I saw the video. Uh, it's the reality, it's the fact that we are sending our crude to other countries. They are refining it and bringing it back to us. We are also flaring our gas, gas that we should have been piping into turbines to generate electricity, uh, gas that we should have. Uh, compressed into LPG or cooking gas so that it will be so cheaply available. But instead, Nigeria flares its own gas and then we go all the way to the United States to go and import cooking gas. <laughs> this, this is the kind of thing that are happening in this country. And uh, I agree with my co-panelist, Mohammed, who says that uh, this whole thing that people talk about, cabas and all of that, uh, if the president is resolute and he wants to change this country, and he wants to take the big decisions. He wants to be on the side of Nigerians. His heart breaks and melts that Nigerians are sleeping on the queue, trying to buy petrol with 700 naira, 1,000 naira. They can't find it. Nigerians are in darkness. Nigerians cannot even see food to eat. If he, if he wants to side with Nigerians, those cabas, immediately they see his body language. They are going to change. Remember that when President Buhari came into office, for the first six months, 
the cabas either they went underground or they ran away from the country because people were saying the body language of the president alone was keeping them at bay so the president uh, is commander in chief of the armed forces he has all the powers and let me tell you, there's no cabal that wants to confront the president of Nigeria. Because I, I, immediately I, I really, the president of Nigeria is turning attention to them. They will calm down because the president will rubbish them and remove that aura, remove that uh, facade that makes them fear. Uh, 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 um, uh, Nick, I ordinarily would have loved to fully agree with you. And there is, there is solid logic solid logic in your in your submission my only fear i, I want us to say this at I, 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 no, at a point my only fear is president bola metunumbu came into power almost a year ago and one was thinking that because he was an oil man and that he would have he would have enough uh, networking assets in the industry to have properly diagnosed the madness that was happening around the Niger Delta, that the issue of oil theft would have been cleansed by now. Uh, that was my own thinking. But given the fact that it's even deteriorating, I'm sitting there thinking, are we not open against hope that this president may be able to handle this? Because everything, just like you said, regarding the leadership of the mismanaged 10 MPC, the continuation of the incompetence of NMPC, everything is a status quo. Status quo ante of the perfidious status quo ante, in fact. So I'm sitting there now thinking the points that you and Mohammed are making as solid as it is the the evidence available to me is speaking to the fact that it may just be we, we may even we may even be going in the worst direction because under Buhari some some fudgy dodgy characters never had the temerity to kill soldiers in the Niger Delta under this president they're shifting the envelope for him gradually and uh, you know, in the next couple of months, maximum another year, people will just give up. My take. I don't know how, uh, how you want to respond to that. I very much I agree with you. I think next month, President Tinubu is going to be a year in office. But he was actually, he won the election and was given certificate of return more than a year ago. That happened in, uh, in February. And then, of course, it was on his mind to be president of Nigeria for many years. So we expected that he was going to come prepared and to hit the ground running and to touch on the big ticket items that are bedevil bedeviling Nigeria today. Uh, unfortunately, his government doesn't seem to be touching at the root causes of problems. They are, they are trying to grab through far downstream. So the government is fighting inflation, Government is fighting the HA rate, but government is... No, no. Inflation is coming as a result of the fact that food inflation, for instance, we're not producing enough food. And the reason why we're not producing enough food is because insecurity has driven farmers away from their farms. And uh, even the farmers that are there, they are using manual uh, labor, which will not produce much. They need mechanization. Nick. You know, so <coughs> the president by now should have touched on security, Nick. should have touched on... Uh, Downstream petroleum refining should have touched on electricity, should have touched on uh, uh, the steel industry, the gas. These are the things we expected that he would, he would talk because if he touches on these things, the economy will just start responding to it and will start booming. And the inflation and the exchange rate and all the things that they are busy fighting now will just die a natural death. This is the way you do it. You know, you are, you, are, you, are, you are talking about electricity tariff. Electricity tariff from 3,000 megawatts. How much is that going to give you? A country that ideally should be having 50 to 100,000 megawatts of electricity. So the, the president is one year in office. We are beginning his appraisal. And we are saying, look, you have already done 25% of your tenure. And we know that the last 25% of your tenure will all be politics. 
In uh, the third year, will be when they will start jostling for positions. So he has only this year that has gone now. Yeah, for real governance. Something begin to touch on the big ticket items so that we can know the direction of his government. Otherwise, now we don't even know the economic let, policy let, let, let me, of this government. Let, let me go to Mohammed and, and let uh, uh, let's give him the opportunity to wrap it up for uh, at least this uh, show. Uh, Mohammed, from the little that Nick has portrayed, uh, and innocently too, from a professional. Uh, just speaking to just speaking to to the facts that he sees and the things that ought to be done uh, and given the last portrayal of the seeming wishy-washy nature of you know uh, is like uh, a friend of mine was jokingly saying that we may end up with uh, a palliative economy economic uh, this thing yeah because everything is almost palliative now uh, I would want to close, Mohammed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, in as much as it's very painful, uh, but I think that's very funny uh, because that's what I uh, realistically the government is turning everything into palliatives. Uh, in fact, there are so many people in town. I mean, on the streets that are that are naming this uh, government the government of palliative. Anyways, I I think yes, even though. One year is almost done. I am an optimist. I so much believe in Nigeria. Uh, I want to believe that um, uh, th this one year is more like an appraisal, uh, a learning call. That we, even though this president perhaps has been dreaming about this job, I mean, being the president of Nigeria for the past maybe 10, 15, or even 20 years since he left gov uh, governorship in Lagos. but. Understand that experience is the best teacher, no matter what. What you are watching from afar, the case is actually very different when you get into the driver's seat. So now that he's, he's in the driver's seat, I want to believe the president, this one year is a serious learning curve for him. Nigerians will really begin to, you know, appraise what he is going to do. Are you there, Mohammed? From next year, I want to believe. And there are perhaps, yes, hello? For what we have been reading in the news, we've been reading in the news, there are perhaps redeployment uh, of ministers that might go on, uh, even though it's not yet announced, but we are reading in the news Mohammed, that there are possibility Mohammed, of redeployment of ministers Mohammed, and even sack of ministers Mohammed, performing. Hello, yes. Mohammed. Uh, yes. I really want to thank yes. you uh, because I don't yeah, really yeah, want... Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I really want yes, to I thank you. I, I really want to thank you for participating in today's uh, show. I really don't want you to go in the direction of speculation because you don't know uh, until they do, you don't know what they will do. So let me just say thank you to you and give the opportunity to Nick to give us his uh, denouement or his uh, epilogue of the sort, his sign of sign of short. Nick, your turn to give him your, your, your sign of short for this. Uh, this episode. Thank you very much, and uh, let's keep optimism high. That like Mohammed said. Thank you, All gentlemen. I really want to appreciate you guys for being pungent, being you know, no oats bar shooting from the hips, typical cowboy style. But you see, we just hope, one hopes that those who are in government will at least listen to some voices of reasoning because it's getting to a point now that um, life for an average nigerian is a bit we leave it at this point it's been a great show for today say thank you to you viewers for keeping company with us i am Bola Oba. Have a good evening.